Assalamu alaikum everyone. Inshallah, I hope you had the chance to watch my latest video, which is how I found Islam. And like I promised, inshallah, I will be continuing this series with uh, life after Islam because I feel like this is the kind of topic like, um, you know, the happily ever after or the, the end in the fairy tales. Like, what happens next? It's not just rainbows and butterflies. Life is, uh, you know, life can be really hard. After I converted, I didn't have any platform to kind of share my newly found beliefs and it was something that I felt like I needed to do. If at least I cannot share it with my family and friends at the time, I needed some kind of venue to share this like new identity that I had discovered. Uh, so I started Aslima. So I started Aslima and everything that I'm going to share with you henceforth um, came to me came to me one way or the other through my blog that I had started. And of course, I never intended to be a blogger or start a blog or anything. I just created this Islima to like, if I want to take a selfie in hijab or if I want to share a verse from like somewhere, I can do it. Your support was what kept me going in my hardest of times. And especially as I had no Muslim friends in real life, I felt like my little mini ummah is in my phone or something. It sounds silly, but for me, it was a big savior. So uh, I will start today, inshallah, with uh, telling you that after I converted to Islam, I fasted my first Ramadan in Estonia. And uh, like I told you in my last video, briefly, it was really difficult for me, especially because I had to hide that I'm fasting because my family didn't know yet. And uh, it was just very, very difficult. So I thought to myself as much as possible because Ramadan happened to fall every year at the time on my uh, summer break. So inshallah, as much as possible, I would try my best to find a way to go abroad and to travel for that period of time, just to practice my faith better, to make the most out of Ramadan. And uh, also because in Ramadan, I tended to want to be on my own. I wanted to read, I wanted to pray. And uh, I didn't want my family to kind of have a negative connotation with Ramadan as if like that's the time when she becomes a loner and that's the time where she becomes like awkward and doesn't want to hang out. No, I wanted them always to think the best of the best about everything in Islam. And because I was still showing them only like very small bits and pieces, I kind of needed my own space and time to reach a certain level in my faith before I was ready to, you know, deal with the rest of the world. And uh, so that's what I felt like I needed to do and uh, I did it. Well, I guess it was in the cards for me, so God made it easy. And if you fight for something strong enough and if, if you, if you uh, believe in something you know, strong enough, it, it will happen, inshallah. So um, the two things that I decided was to leave Estonia for every Ramadan as much as possible. And online at the at the time I'd read some kind of quote like why would you not wear hijab in Ramadan that's only like fasting 50% or something. So at the time I didn't really know how to make a difference like what is the rightful knowledge and what is not so kind of like whatever s seemed legit. Um, you know, not necessarily that I would follow, but it would go in the back of my head. So this was one of those things. So I was like, oh my God, what if this quote is right? What if this, what if that? Like, I want to fast 100%. I want to do my best. So, and this is definitely no offense to anyone who doesn't wear hijab. I'm just sharing with my experience of what happened. So I thought to myself, okay, at least when I fast, I want to do it 100%. What does that mean? That means I want to also... Uh, cover myself when I fast and of course in Estonia that was extremely difficult because we live in a country where like <laughs> no uh, so these were like the two things I decided for myself that as much as possible I want to implement uh, no matter how difficult it is so the next year alhamdulillah in university my scores were good enough that one day I received an email that I would get tuition freedom from university because I am scoring top grades so alhamdulillah uh, my dad was the one to pay for my college tuition so I asked him, the money that you would otherwise pay for my tuition, can I please have it and uh, go somewhere and volunteer with this money? So in my mind, at the time, I was like a, you know, like a hasanat calculator, like literally, aha, uh -huh, okay, if I do this, I get two points and then this and I get three points and uh, if I do that, the minus one. It was literally like a Super Mario game for me or something like it was all about collecting like hasanat and this and that. So I was like, oh, I read that in Ramadan. If you do something good, the good deed is like multiplied like, I don't know, 70 or 700 or like infinity amount of time. So I was like, oh my God, if I can go and I can volunteer, then my like hasanat can go like that. And then at the same time, I can practice and I can do something good and I 
can be somewhere away from Estonia for that time and I can cover because no one knows who I am so inshallah it will be easy so yeah I started googling online and I found this orphanage uh, like for me it didn't have to be Ghana I just uh, thought I'm gonna be the next Angelina Jolie and uh, it just needs to be Africa so like, stupid uh, well, not stupid but you know like uh, so anyway, I found an orphanage uh, online in Ghana that had a Muslim owner. So this was like the done deal for me. I needed something because I didn't find any Islamic orphanages that accepted uh, that accepted volunteers. I didn't find any Islamic organizations that would allow you to go as a group at the time. So maybe it was my lack of Googling skills or maybe they just didn't exist at the time. I don't know. So I found this orphanage. I contacted them. Everything went well. Uh, I paid the money and yes to everyone asking I went on my own it was really crazy and uh, so in reality it had nothing to do with being the next Angelina Jolie it was definitely one of the hardest things that I've ever done in my life um, but the number one reason actually that I went was fortunately or unfortunately it was for selfish reasons I wanted to change the condition of my heart kind of I felt like Everything that I have, I'm taking it for granted. I'm not necessarily grateful for anything and I wanted that gratitude in my heart. So um, when I went, the place where I stayed, I lived inside the orphanage with everyone else in one of the rooms and the closest city was 70 kilometers away, which meant in any of my free time, I was still at the orphanage and still with the same kids and I had nobody else to interact with. So that made it definitely like 10 times harder than maybe it would have been for anyone else who was either with a group or who was volunteering in a city where at least by the end of the day you can go out somewhere and grab a pizza and watch a movie. But for me, it was five weeks of only staying in this orphanage with them 24-7, living like them 24-7. I thought that I was going uh, to Africa so it has to be hot right no it wasn't hot it was actually quite chilly so I hadn't packed any warm clothes and I arrived there and I find like 40 kids who are freezing and all they want is warm clothes and I don't have any so I would end up like giving my maxi skirts and I don't know like my longer clothing for them as blankets just because they were cold so that brings me back to the point that yes I got what I wanted out of that trip the gratitude that arose inside my soul was insane all their electricity came from solar energy so when there was no sun there was no electricity which meant sometimes i wouldn't have my phone or anything for a couple of days so my family thought like she's done um uh, so that was definitely an experience you know showering out of a bucket and eating what they eat and fasting at the same time which left me kind of um without a lot of energy to deal with them as much as I would have liked to. Uh, I went just to be their caretaker and to teach them English and uh, I became very, very close with the kids. But at the same time, I was really struggling with myself as well. Like I kept a diary. I still have that diary somewhere in my mom's house where I documented every single day and I tried to read Quran. And uh, so it was definitely an experience. A few of the kids in the orphanage were also Muslim. Uh, and they would be like, no, how can I fast? I'm already so skinny, like blah, 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 blah. And, uh, but they're just kids. And anyway, like if anyone doesn't need to fast, it's them, of course, like uh, the, all their uh, food is coming from donations. And uh, <sighs> yeah, but there were a couple of kids in the orphanage that were Muslim. So uh, they would ask me to gift them like an alarm clock and then I would gift them an alarm clock and they would put the alarm and then they would sneak into my room at like 3 a.m. and share my sandwich because they didn't have uh, food to eat suhoor. Uh, so that was really, really like a nice memories I'm taking back from that trip. But uh, it's a nice memory now. I remember when I was in the midst of that experience, it was extremely difficult for me. I remember there was this kid Bryce I loved him so much so I just wish I could know where he is now and what he's doing and there was Habiba and Sakina and uh, a lot of really 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 amazing kids and they're so unspoiled by this world like even teenager boys would play with Barbies and there's no like ugh, like th th this doesn't exist they're so pure you've never seen anything like it like it was the first time i got my tablet and there were cartoons on it and they were so amazed like oh my god what is this and uh, it was just a really really nice experience and um so yeah that was my first experience and like i said i always promised that i would wear hijab so this was the first time that i wore hijab 
uh, for five weeks. Uh, and it was very difficult for me. I had barely any hijab friendly clothes. I remember it was very difficult for me to start changing my wardrobe because no matter what I wore or what I put together, I felt like grandma. And my mom would not fail to point that out to me. Every day she would be like, why do you look like grandma? Look at yourself, like what are you wearing? So it was very difficult as someone without any money i'm still going to school i don't have the budget to change my wardrobe uh, all the bloggers that i looked at or any websites where i would see like long sleeved clothing and dresses at the time they were very few and they would be very expensive so i didn't have the budget even to change my wardrobe and i really didn't like to have like a t-shirt cut and then like long sleeve it was really i didn't like it so and all of my wardrobe before islam was like shorts you know like the length of someone's underwear or something and uh, tank tops and all of that stuff so it was not easy the transformation definitely so i remember that was a huge 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 challenge for me at the time i had maybe like a few scarves i got from ebay and uh, maybe a few like five ten dollar skirts i found online something used i think uh so that was the whole wardrobe that i had and um I remember when I met other volunteers, still I'm at a phase where I'm not, I believe very strongly, but my knowledge about the faith is not as strong yet. So when someone would attack Islam, I wouldn't be yet like equipped with the knowledge to uh, contradict what they're saying or like defend it in a way. And I really, really, really didn't like that phase. I felt like I need to learn and I need to learn quickly because if somebody says something, I need to be able to reciprocate a uh, response. And I remember when other volunteers started coming in from uh, Holland and France and Spain uh, and many of them were very like iffy about Islam and some of them even anti-Islam at, um, at some point. So I remember wanting to be more knowledgeable and it was, it was, uh, it was hard. Uh, and I remember all the girls, you know, they were eating all day and they were in their shorts and swimming and bikini. And I had promised myself, even though I was not hijabi at the time, I had promised myself that I'm fasting, I'm going to do it right, I'm going to cover properly. Uh, so I remember it was the first time. It was very difficult for me. I, I felt, I remember I felt ugly. I felt, I felt out of place. I felt like, I thought I'm supposed to feel like I belong now, but I still don't feel like I belong. And it was just like a very big mix of emotions because for a long time within Islam, I didn't find my place in Islam. Like I would always see really extremist Muslims who are like, everything is haram. And then on the other hand, all the Muslims that I felt are so cool to hang out with, but they don't necessarily practice almost anything. Like they don't pray, they barely if ever go to Jumu'ah and maybe they fast so and I, I was at neither one of these extremes so it was very difficult at first for me to find a place like where do I fit in so yeah that was Ghana uh, it was really nice it was Ramadan we collected a lot of donations from the Estonian community like everyone got a new mattress and um, yeah even though I took the pills I got malaria so that was another thing like I'm all alone in the middle of Ghana and I got malaria um, but all in all, it was an experience that gave me a lot of gratitude. It uh, grew me a lot in appreciation and uh, it's definitely something I'm really, really glad I did. And I'm glad I did it then when my Iman was like over the roof because I don't know if I would be able to do it now. Like if I ever went again, I would definitely want to go with a group and um, yeah, inshallah, you never know. I would like to but we'll see so anyway that was Ghana so I uh, went back to Estonia from Ghana and uh, that was it continued my university uh, until the next Ramadan came so of course a lot of things happened in between but I'm kind of sharing with you the highlights of the past five years so the next Ramadan came so I was like okay I need to prepare like what what what's my next Ramadan so next Ramadan uh, I was asking everywhere in the local Islamic center and everywhere like uh, where can I go? What can I do? I need to escape for Ramadan and uh, Alhamdulillah, I found an opportunity to study Arabic in Egypt That is phase two <laughs> uh, Now you guys know how much I love Egypt But I've never been to Egypt till that moment as a single woman and to Cairo 
and to Nasser City and to next to Sirag Mall. Uh, so if you're Egyptian or if you know the area, you will understand already just by saying the sentence that it's definitely not something easy. So, uh, but this was not an experience with negative connotations in my mind. It was just an experience that helped me a lot in independence. Um, because when I went, I was still like this, you know, childish girl and like everything's a butterfly and yay, pink and I don't know what. But when you have to live in Egypt alone as a woman in Cairo, you need to grow up. <laughs> like life is not a butterfly. So I got a program. Uh, that's how. So this is answering the questions when you ask how I could afford to travel. I would kind of find these things or these ways to travel. So I went to Egypt, it was five weeks, it was an Arabic school. I don't know if that school still works or not. And again, to answer your question, I don't speak Arabic, but I can read and write, like I said. And uh, like from the time when I studied Fusha, I can only like say a couple of like silly things like, um, so like, whatever. And uh, that was Egypt, five weeks, independence boost. Okay, خلاص. moving on. So I went back from Egypt, uh, again, continued university. I studied English, by the way, and that's why I'm an English teacher. Uh, and the reason I studied English is not because I have like a childhood obsession with English or I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. No, I studied something that I researched that would allow me to provide for myself, to start a new life for myself, to move to another country and to have kind of a profession that I could work anywhere basically but my eye was always uh, on the Middle East and on the GCC so that is the reason I studied it. It was always like it was all calculated out. I needed to leave, I needed to make a life for myself so this was like one of those things on the way that I needed to do. So now moving on to the Singaporean experience. Uh, I graduated university but then I started sending my CVs everywhere and then you get to realize that ooh, if you have no experience, no one's going to hire you. So you're like, okay, how am I ever going to work if no one's going to hire me? And I have no experience, so how am I going to get that experience? So anyway. And then uh, at the time, I had already started my blog and my channel, which is Eslima. A lot of you asked me, what is Eslima? Eslima is Estonian Muslima. Ta-da! <laughs> it's not my real name. My real name is Eileen, or like my parents call me Eileen. Uh, anyway. And um, so I had started Islima and at the time I think I had 8,000 followers, I think so. And uh, there was this really sweet girl following me from Indonesia, her name was Nadia. And this Nadia, her heart kind of like went out for me. And she knew my story of how I reverted or converted and I was looking for a job and I couldn't find a job and I wanted to emigrate and I wanted to wear the hijab and actually guys, the number one reason why I wanted to leave I had many I had like 10 reasons but the number one reason was that I had gotten to the point where I wanted to wear the hijab so my hijab story is another story but basically I wanted to wear the hijab and I knew that in Estonia I couldn't so that was the number one thing that motivated me to go somewhere else because somewhere else like I told you in Egypt and in, in uh, Ghana and wherever I would travel it was always easy to put on the headscarf because no one knew me, so I didn't care. It was just hard in that place where everybody knew me. So, um, so anyway, one day I get a message from this Nadia that uh, she has a job offer for me in Singapore and it is working with like hijabs and being like a social media marketing something. And you know, I was like, oh my, I was on top of the world. I was like, this is it. This is the answer to my prayers. This is, oh my God, this is the stuff. I made like 100 gazillion million prayers and gratitude and alhamdulillah and thank you and I don't know what. And uh, so they sponsored my ticket and said that the first month when I work for them, I'm not going to receive a salary because they are going to cover my expenses and accommodation would be provided. And uh, yeah, that's it. And I was arriving one day before Ramadan. Someone is taking selfies. 
Uh, I arrived one day before Ramadan, so all of it made sense. Again, I can arrive, I can cover my head, it's Ramadan, I can cover, I can escape, all of that. It was like the best thing ever. So, mm, I arrived to Singapore, as always, put on the headscarf when I arrived to the airport, went through customs, arrived, met the owner of the company, everything seemed nice. Um, again, guys, I don't know how much to stress on the fact that there's a lot more that happened, but because other people are involved in shaping me and in forming my story, and I have to take their emotions also into consideration, and the stories I have are very specific, so it's not like, oh, maybe it was her, maybe it was someone else. Like, no, you're gonna know it was this person. So the juice and the gist of certain people and the experiences I had with them, I have to really keep it to a minimum because I don't want to offend them, I don't want to upset them, and I don't want them to be angry at me. Uh, so I'm going to just mention some things very shortly, very briefly, and in the most polite way that I can. So anyway, I arrived there, and I'm supposed to start the work. So I remember that day I went to sleep, and in the middle of the night, someone else came to my bed. What is happening? Okay. I really, really, I am trying to be nice about it, but till today I don't really understand that. But what I was told is that um, we said accommodation provided, we didn't say private accommodation provided. So I was like, okay. And I was starting to feel a bit down, but I didn't complain to anyone because I was like, I left home and I told everyone this is my dream and this is it and this is like, ooh, this is the life. So I cannot just be like, oh no, wanna come back? This crazy. So I continued and I bared with many things and so in the end it was not a social media job at all It was me kind of being a shop girl having to sell scarves and So which which is not something I Thought I was going there for and I remember it was Ramadan and in the entire Ramadan There was only two days off which was very disappointing for me at the time because I was still in my really high Iman phase so I wanted to maximize the month, I wanted to go to the mosque, I wanted to read, I wanted to dedicate and worship, so I thought at least I would have weekends, but in the whole month I had two days off. So, long story short, the owner of the company was not happy with me, maybe I was still a spoiled brat, which I probably was, I was still young and naive and all this new attention on me from my blog at the time, I didn't know how to handle it, I didn't know how to act maybe, even though... I always asked that it wouldn't um, overcloud my judgment and my intentions, but I think it did. Uh, so she wasn't happy with me and I was not happy with her. So uh, from the day that I had my day off, we both talked to each other and we're like, no, it's not working out. I wanted to quit and she wanted me to leave, so it was mutual. We, For the first time in my life, I didn't get along with someone. So khalas, it is what it is and I was really really scared to complain to anyone at the time. I remember that. I was crying on my own. <laughs> Here's where the tears start. You're gonna hear a lot of crying for the rest of the story. So we decided to go separate ways. And um, I met two girls over there that became really close to my heart. In Taraweh I met uh, an American convert, uh, Sara. I love you Sara if you're watching. And Mai, I miss you Mai if you're watching also. Uh, they were two really, really close friends over there who helped me through everything. And uh, I remember in Singapore, it was the first time in my life that I started to get noticed or recognized for my blog, I remember. Uh, I was in the Sultan Ahmed Mosque uh, for Taraweh and suddenly someone's like, Eslima! And you know, for me, I've never heard anyone say Eslima out loud before. It's just my username. So I'm like, no, no. Whatever. And I keep going and like, Aslima, Aslima. And then I'm like, sounds familiar. Is it me? Like, So it, it was like this phase where my blog kind of like started growing and started opening up and I started like meeting people from my blog. So it was definitely an encouraging move uh, in my story. And uh, yeah, so after that, a few days passed and I was supposed to fly back home and um, This was a time where without intending to, which is the case in my life a lot of the time, I never intend on purpose to harm someone, but more often than not, it happens somehow. 
yeah, we kind of went our separate ways. I was supposed to fly back to Estonia after a few days, uh, but I had intended to be there for the entire month of Ramadan. But we had decided that we're not getting along and we don't like each other. Um, and I needed to go back early, which was a very big problem for me because I have that promise that I need to cover the entire Ramadan and I am supposedly flying back for the last 10 nights and I'm like, oh my God, I cannot remove my hijab. But before I got to that point, I, uh, I did something that was not very nice towards the owner of that company and I didn't intend to. I don't know what I was thinking, maybe I was just young and maybe really the attention overclouded my judgment, I don't know, but everyone makes mistakes. So I made a minor mistake and I upset her. And uh, the things that she would tell me after would haunt me for the next couple of years, how she will never forgive me and uh, like she hopes Allah will forgive me because she never will. And like for me, that was something that pierced through my heart. Like I can remember for the next couple of years, at Fajr time, I would still every single night like keep praying like, oh my God, 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 oh my God. Like if I die, I cannot die if she doesn't forgive me and please, yeah, don't be like, please let her forgive me and na 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 um, It's not like I murdered someone, but for her, it was something that hurt her in specific. So uh, for the next couple of years, I didn't get her forgiveness. I would write her emails and I would try to contact her, but there was just no way back to her. So that was something that always weighed on my heart for the next couple of years. Um, but let's just keep it at this place right now. Whilst I continue this series of la 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 until I reach Qatar and all the way in Qatar, this specific incident is going to find and resolve itself, but way later. So when I was in the airport, coming back to Estonia, of course, I cannot arrive to Estonia like all covered and all in hijab and everything. And I'm like, but I promised myself that every Ramadan I'm going to cover and I was last in the night and la, 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 I feel like such a hypocrite. So in the bathroom, in the Turkish airport, because that's where my transit was, I'm about to take it off. And I'm like, I can't. And I'm really, I'm like, I can't. I feel like a hypocrite. How? How? Can and at the time, I'd already started my channel, so everyone knows me as if I'm hijabi. I never said openly that I was full-time, but the guilt of other people thinking that I do commit to the hijab properly was definitely another push. So all of you guys actually motivated me to put on the permanent hijab. Uh, so yeah, I didn't remove it. I kind of did like a turban situation with like those uh, ninja like neck under scarves and I thought I looked really cool. Like I have to share a picture with you guys like, oh my goodness. And of course, the first thing I entered the Estonian airport and they pull me to the side and they're like, excuse me, miss, like, who are you and what are you doing? But alhamdulillah, I got passed. And so for the rest of that Ramadan, I wore a hoodie on my head when I went out or it was a colder summer, so maybe a beanie. Um, but most of the time it was a hoodie, but like my family was traveling at the time, I think. So it wasn't that big of a deal. And like if you wear a hoodie and like a tracksuit, people don't notice as much. And uh, subhanAllah, like from that day in the airport, I never intended that this is going to be now the time that I start wearing hijab. But since then, I didn't really promise God that this is it. But that's the time I started committing to it full time. 